So Paul is a really interesting character. He would actually um, go from someone who was considered to be a thug, here we go, uh, among the churches and people who would be scared of him. But he would be the main person spreading the gospel towards the wider world. The book of Acts is, is I think, divided into two halves. The first half is, generally speaking, people preaching and speaking to the wider Jerusalem or the Judea area. But after about chapter 15, we see the church take a turn from there and start preaching to the wider world. Why? Because in Acts chapter 15, we see just a problem arising when a couple of people would go down and teach people that in order to go to Jesus, you first have to be baptized, or sorry, you, ha you first have to have circumcision. And a lot of people th thought, well, well, that doesn't really make much sense given our experience. And guys like Paul and Peter, they shared their experiences with the wider Jerusalem churches. And from that, those experiences, they realized, well, whoa, God is doing something amazing here. Who are we to stand in God's way? So Paul and Barnabas, they're beginning their second missionary journey, starting in, I believe, uh, 16, chapter 16. And first, they decided that, look, we're going to go to all the churches that we planted before, and we're just going to encourage them. We're just going to uh, go to the people that we've met before, our friends, the people that we know. This is going to be easy. Wrong. Because one night, Paul gets this vision, and this vision is where we hear what, what is referred to as the Macedonian call, where he sees this man in his vision from Macedonia saying, Paul, we need your help. And what was once just a very specific, very tiny in scope mission became this huge mission. So that is not without you know, a lot of suffering, a lot of difficulty because they're breaking new ground. So what ended up happening in Acts chapter 16 and early in chapter 17, if you turn there, uh, Actually, I'm going to turn to verse 10. We see, we see Paul going to Philippi and then Thessalonica. Philippi and Thessalonica, they, were, they didn't turn out so hot for Paul. They pretty much ran him out of town. And in Berea, it, they absorbed the word and they were actually positive there to the gospel message. And from there, they were driven out again. And that's where we find him here in verse chapter 10. And the brethren immediately sent Paul and Silas away by night to Berea, and when they arrived, they went into the synagogue of the Jews. Now these were more noble-minded than those in Thessalonica, for they received the word with great eagerness, examining the scriptures daily to see whether these things were so. Many of them therefore believed along with a number of prominent Greek women and men. But when the Jews of Thessalonica found out the word of God had been proclaimed by Paul and Berea also, they came there likewise, agitating and stirring up the crowds. And then immediately the brethren sent Paul out to go as far as the sea, and Silas and Timothy remained there. Now those who conducted Paul brought him as far as Athens, and receiving a command for Silas and Timothy to come to him as soon as possible, they departed. So that's where we see uh, here. While Paul was waiting on them in Athens, he was greatly distressed to see that the city was full of idols. So he reasoned in the synagogue with both Jews and God-fearing Greeks, as well as in the marketplace day by day with those who happened to be there. So you see him in, uh, preaching to two different groups of people here. A group of Epicurean and Stoic philosophers began to debate with him. Some of them asked, what is this babbler trying to say? Others remarked, he seems to be ab advocating foreign gods. They said this because Paul was preaching the good news about Jesus and the resurrection. Then they took him and brought him to a meeting of the area Opagus, or that is uh, Ares Hill, and in Latin that would be Mars Hill, where they said to him, may we know what this new teaching is that you are presenting. You are bringing some strange ideas to our ears, and we would like to know what they mean. And Luke makes an insertion, all the Athenians and the foreigners who live there spent their time doing nothing but talking about and listening to the latest ideas. That is to say that, you know, they're, they're, they probably had the veneer of, oh, we're just truth seekers. We want to know what the truth is. But really, they just want to know what's the hottest, newest, trendiest topic, you know, being taught in the streets. 
Paul then stood up in the meeting of the Areopagus and said, people of Athens, I see that in every way you are very religious, for as I walked around and looked carefully at your object of worship, sorry, objects of worship, I even found an altar with this inscription to an unknown God. So you are ignorant of the very thing you worship. And this is what I am going to proclaim to you. The God who made the world, excuse me, and everything it is, the, uh, the Lord of heaven and earth, and does not live in temples built by human hands. And he is not served by human hands as if he needed anything. Rather, that he himself gives everyone life and breath and everything else. From one man he made all the nations that they should inhabit the whole earth, and he marked out their appointed times in history and the boundaries of their lands. God did this so that they would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him, though he is not far from any one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being. As some of your own poets have said, we are his offspring. Therefore, since we are God's offspring, we should not think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image made by human design and skill. In the past, God overlooked such ignorance, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent, for he has set a day when he will judge the world with justice by the man he has appointed. He has given proof of this to everyone by raising him from the dead. So what an amazing thing that Paul did. He went alone. He was still waiting for Silas and Timothy, his missionary team, to catch up to him. But the moment he stepped foot, you know, in town, the moment he went off the boat, he saw everything. And typically when you, you know, jump off a plane or jump off the boat or off the bus and you go into a new town, you probably think, wow, this place looks amazing. Instead, Paul was like, what a dump. Right? His reaction, it was like his spirit was greatly distressed. In my translation, I believe, his spirit was being provoked within him as he was beholding the city full of idols. Parents here would probably recall, like maybe you stepped into your kid's room, maybe during the summer after a week of them not, you know, Keep, uh, keeping up appearances or cleaning up the room, you probably think, oh, this room is a mess. And those, maybe those who've stepped into maybe like a, an apartment building in, in like, you know, the less than wealthy part of town and just step into the hallways and, you know, maybe there's like a really foul old floor. Like that was so, that's something that you probably noticed immediately. When Paul stepped into Athens, he wasn't thinking, oh, look at the culture, look at the architecture. Look at the people, look at the food. Oh, it smells great. Instead, it's almost like he noticed immediately this layer of just stink pervading the city. And so why would Paul react that way? Paul has a heart that is in line with God's will. And we see that in verse 16. What does that mean? Well, we have to take a look at who Paul is, first of all. We first see Paul, at least in, in the book of Acts, we see him as Saul. He's not called Paul yet. And he is one of the people who was among the crowd when Stephen was being so. In fact, in I believe in chapter 8, verse 1, your translations in the NIV would probably say, uh, the killing of Stephen, Paul approved of, but in my translation, uh, it says, and Saul was in hearty agreement with putting him, that is Stephen, to death. <laughs> I don't know about you guys, but hearty agreement doesn't just seem like just, you know, just a mental acknowledgement of, oh yeah, this was the right thing to do. It's almost like this, like this radical belief that this killing of this guy, this unjust killing of this person was a really, really good thing. And it's almost like, I, I doubt that Saul was probably laughing at this point, but he was probably, he probably had like this religious, fervor of like a radical, you know, just like, you know, on fire for what he believes is God's will. So that's the Paul that we, we first see. Then we see Paul later on in the passage, just taking men and women away from their homes, you know, ravaging the church and sending them off to Jerusalem. In chapter nine, he even asks the high priest, hey, can I have permission to go to every synagogue uh, so that I may have it, like, 
so the IMA in every community be allowed to just go inside homes and take Christians and send them off away bound to Jerusalem. That's who Paul was. So even when Paul later on, you know, as he's you know going on that trip from uh, from Jerusalem on the way to Damascus, he meets Jesus and he becomes baptized. But even then, you know, if you were a Christian then, and you know, there's someone who walks in and they're probably say maybe uh, Stephen Dawkins or, or Stephen Hawking for, for that. You know, like, if there was, like, an adamant atheist who just walked into our uh, church and said, yeah, I'm a Christian now, we, we wouldn't believe that person. So if you were a Christian, you'd probably be, be very fearful of Paul. So that's who Paul was. Why does this matter? Well, Paul developed a heart for God's will. Now, I don't know what was going on in Paul's heart at the time, but I can imagine that, well, you, you were just, when you meet Jesus, something happens. What happened with Paul, I imagine, that he probably thought he wasted a lot of his time, right? He spent many years uh, learning to be a rabbi. He spent many years training in the Greco-Roman culture. But here was Jesus who turned his life upside down. What was I doing all my life? So Paul recognized that because he had a need, and his need was met, these people also had a need, and he can meet that need uh, like by showing them Jesus. Paul also recognized that each person started at a different place. How do we know that? We see him speaking in the marketplaces, in the synagogues, right? And later on, he'd go off to uh, this place that's, I guess, more elite, or, uh, more private in the Areopagus, but he would, in, in this just one chapter, we see him in three different places. Paul was meeting three different types of people. Notice how he used three different tactics. In the synagogues, well, first of all, that was Paul's modus operandi, right? The first thing he'd do was step into synagogues, and he'd debate with people. He'd wrestle with them. Uh, and the word debate in the passage earlier on um, is more of like a proclamation, but room f- it had room for dialogue. So he was able to dialogue people. They gave him the time to say his piece, then they, then they would you know, try to like, pick apart what his arguments were. And Paul did that often. He did that in every single city that he went to. So you can imagine Paul just talking about Jesus and talking about the resurrection, uh, but he'd do so in a way that probably, well, most likely, uh, look towards Scripture and then have, show how they point towards Jesus. Now, out in the marketplace, he'd talk about the same message, but he would probably talk about it in a different way. And we can see sort of how he does that later on in the Areopagus. So notice how, uh, first of all, it's a city full of idols. He would have taken that into uh, account. He, then he was talking to Jews and God-fearing Greeks. Those are the people in the synagogues. And in the marketplace, he would probably be seeing Epicureans and Stoics. So Epicureans and Stoics, they're types of philosophies. Epicureanism is uh, what is called a materialistic deism, which is to say that they believe that there is a God, uh, but that God is so far removed that he probably can't affect anything in our lives. That is to say that they, uh, God created, but they were then able to do whatever they wanted in their current life. And the primary good, I believe, in Epicureanism is to avoid pain and suffering. And I suppose that also led to them going off and doing whatever they wanted. They pursued all sorts of lusts and sensualities and lived in absolute excess. They lived in extravagance. You can probably imagine that, seeing as there, <laughs> there's a lot of them here in Athens. Stoics, on the other hand, were almost like the complete opposite. They were materialistic too. Uh, that is, they didn't believe much of like a conscious afterlife, but they were pantheists. That is to say that they believed that God was this sort of impersonal force that, that probably didn't think, but just created them, uh, but had nothing to do with them after that. So these philosophies... They had this in common. One, they lived in extravagance for one of them. And two, 
Uh, the other one lived in absolute self-discipline for Stoics because the primary good there, I believe, was duty in that they kind of, they were deterministic and they went with the flow. And the best thing that you can do in life is to just accept that there's going to be pain in life and then you were just to be self-disciplined and, and I would say uh, be self-sufficient to deal with it. In both sides, they had this in common that they were self-sufficient in that they were more or less the gods of their lives. So Paul was dealing with those people, and you can see that in his response to them. I'm just going to move back a little bit, <laughs> just for everyone. So he starts off by saying, the God who made the world and everything it is, the Lord of heaven and earth, and does not, I'm just going to go to my own translation, And does not dwell in temples made with hands. So he's, refer he's referencing the temple of Athena that's probably nearby. And maybe even what was once the site of the temple of Ares, which the Areopagus is, is situated nearby. And around this time, there was this unfinished temple of Zeus. So this was a very, very wealthy city in terms of religious religiosity. So what are you, what are you saying, Paul? Are you saying that... God should not be worshipped in temples? And, and, and Paul was saying, yes. Then he goes off and saying, he needed, um, so neither is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives life, uh, gives to all life and breath and all things. So God made everything. Which, is, uh, which implies that God made you and me. And they would probably say, okay, that's good, because some of their philosophers uh, believe that they're you know, children of gods, not the children of God, but of gods. But, but Paul would sort of address those things. And finally, just to cap it off, uh, Paul says, from him we live and move and exist, as even some of your own poets have said, for we are also his offspring. Being then the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the divine nature is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by the art and thought of man. So what he's saying is that, look, you guys are wasting your time. There is one God who exists, and he has come here, and he declares that you guys repent. And they're saying, like, whoa, 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 whoa. We have no frame of reference as to what in the world you're saying. So it would make sense that they would, you know, scoff at him. They wouldn't understand like why one plus one equals two here, because what Paul is, is Paul is sort of like starting off from the bottom. He's instead of like looking at Old Testament scriptures and st and just you know con uh, and just giving those scriptures to them, he's starting them off from Genesis one. He's starting them off from the very very basics, and using what they already knew, using philosophies, using philosophers that he's referencing. He's using their lingo, their literature their most prominent speakers, he's using them in order to formulate a biblical argument without using scripture. He might be alluding to scripture and he might be alluding to the, the one man who God had appointed, Jesus Christ, but he's not giving them too much that they could not handle. He's giving them enough so that when judgment day comes, they have no excuse. So we see here Paul using maybe two, at the very least, two different methods of reaching out to people. One with the Jews, he's using Old Testament scripture. And here, amongst the Gentiles, he's using what they know. Using general revelation, using general knowledge. So Paul definitely has a couple tools in his tool belt. And Paul has that because he's trained to do so. So Paul here has a method as well as different tactics. So tactics would probably be um, like maybe the minute little plans that you might have when encountering different, uh, I would say, resistance. But he has an overarching strategy which sort of goes over those little tactics. The first one being that Paul here observes. He steps into the city 
and he lays out his feelers, right? Now, a part of his training and a part of his background, he already knows what some of what the people's beliefs are, but he like, you know, took some time to scope out the area. He understood what the people needed, and he knew their lingo. And then Paul intervened. He stepped down into their lives. He went to the synagogues. He went to the streets. Went where the people were. He interacted with them. He dialogued with them. He didn't just talk at them, right? He wasn't on some... Well, I was going to say he wasn't on a soapbox, but I wasn't there. <laughs> but he, he, was, he, was, he definitely had room for dialogue between people. people. He allowed people to ask him questions, to poke and prod him. And he did so because he wanted them to know. He wasn't trying to win any arguments. Have you ever been in one of those arguments? I have. I remember a, a long time ago, I was in a bus, and there was this person, uh, I was on my way to Bible college, and there was this person who noticed that I had a Bible, and he started picking apart all the things that, you know, what he'd seen online that other atheists would pick apart Christianity with. And my, I guess, I sort of was caught in the defensive, and from there I sort of you know, my goal was to win from that point onward. I wasn't accomplishing anything. If anything, I was just feeding my own ego. But what we need to do is to recognize that there is a need. We had a need. Paul had a need. And Jesus meets that need. And what Paul is trying to do is getting these people to understand in their terms, with their lingo, in their worldview, just why their worldview cannot save them. Because Jesus saves. Because the only way to combat death and to combat sin is to kneel down in front of the cross and repent, which is just exactly what he calls on them to do. Notice how Paul is not afraid to do that. I find myself be very afraid sometimes to call people out, like, look, this is where your life is going towards, this is not healthy for you or the people around you, this is why I believe that you should blah, blah, blah. I'm typically not the type of person to give the hard clothes, but I don't need to be. Paul's that person. You might not necessarily be that person, but it seems here that Paul is using his gifts his abilities, his education, his experiences, maybe his hobbies, to preach the word of God. Not everyone who preaches the word of God has to stand up over here. Is that something that we all believe? Is it our belief that the people whose job it is to primarily spread the word of God, the people that we hire? Really? Because if it is, then you see 10% of the people doing 90% of the work. Should be the 90% of the people be doing 90% of the work. Because otherwise, where's the balance? Ever heard of burnout? I promised myself I'd <laughs> tone it down a bit. So we must develop a heart for God, for God's will. And we have to also understand that each person starts at a different place. So there's a need. Does that necessarily mean that we must all, you know, go off and go join a ministry right away? No. We need to really take stock of what we have. We have gifts, talents, experiences, education, hobbies. All these things can be and should be used to further the word of God. I usually have a challenge to churches who, you know, are not very uh, evangelistic-minded. The first thing I ask them is, where do I expect myself and my family to be in my faith or our faith within the next month? What about the next year? That's the first question. The second question sort of goes in hand with that. The second question goes like this. What is the primary need of the communities around me? And what are we, not I, what are we doing to meet that need? I, was, I, I, I wanted to give just a, a really short example, but I'm sort of, you know, doing blue-collar work for the very first time in my life. I'm, 
Uh, I'm a trained chef right now, and I meet a lot of people, and one of the things that I've noticed is that as I'm, oh, as I'm observing things, I've noticed just an influx of, say, for instance, in here in the greater Toronto area, we have a huge influx of international students. I noticed that also after talking with them, going down and then just really dialoguing with them, that a lot of them have a lot of depth because one of the things they focus on, for instance, this, is, you don't, this doesn't have to be anyone's ministry, but this is just an example of something that, that I'm going, uh, going through, is that one of the things that they struggle with is huge just amounts of student debt because one of the things they do in order to become a Canadian citizen is to uh, join a college program or a university program, go through it, get your permanent residence, and bam, you're a citizen, more or less. It, it's not as simple as that, but uh, if you're talking with anyone uh, right now who's come into the country recently, and I mean like really, really uh, recently, uh, some of us are sitting here today, Getting your PR is very important, and it's really expensive coming here for the first time. This is not a very visitor-friendly place to be right now. So what are we doing to meet those needs? So I don't have an answer right now, but I think this is a useful question because there are so many needs out there right now. You might ask, well, look, I, I, I admit, Kim, that I haven't thought about this. And that's okay. Because it really takes some effort to do the, fir the very first step, to observe. You're not just, you know, casually walking about and just like walking down the street. You're actually taking the time, laying out your feelers, asking questions, probing people. You're doing some research about the area. One of the things that w w would probably be useful is to look at surveys, to look at, you know, call different uh, organizations and, and who are like out, like, boots on the ground type work and ask them, hey, what are the, uh, some of the things that you guys are dealing with and what can we do as a church to help you? Has anyone done that recently? I notice it's a little bit awkward in here right now because this looks like I'm sort of, you know, pointing a finger at leadership, but no, this, I'm not pointing a finger at leadership. I'm pointing a finger at myself, at each and every single person sitting here today. Again, I'm not, the per I'm not the type of person to give like this hard close, and for that I apologize. I find that I apologize a lot, but this is something that I struggle with too. I, I like it when people like me. You guys like it when people like you too, right? The gospel is not a very palatable piece of news. People don't see it as good news, but it is. And it's our job to make them understand that it is. Because we all have to wrestle with what Jesus has done for us. We all have to understand the journey. Like, if you read the Bible from end to end, there's this journey taking place from point A to point B, and we're sort of like uh, at the cusp, like at, towards the end of human history, and we have to realize that, look, there's still a story yet to be told, and we... I have to make a choice within ourselves to decide whether we want to be a part of that story or not. And that story is salvation. That story is restoration history. If we want, you know, to be good servants, if we want to be like Paul, to be brave, we first have to start with observing, intervening, and talking to people. And it's easier than you think. Because taking into account that we're using our gifts, our hobbies, you know, our experiences, we're already doing what we love. They're just now being used in service to God. So as we stand up and sing, let, let us all just take this all into account. Let's take seriously the challenge that I'm giving myself and to everyone here. Where am I going in the next month? How am I growing in the next year? How are we doing all that together? Let's stand.